Good morning. I'm Rabbi Ed Feinstein. This is Valley Beth Shalov live and online. It's Shavuot, and it is a joy to spend some time together um, learning some Torah as we begin to celebrate the Shavuot holiday. Uh, on Shavuot, there's a, a beautiful, beautiful book of the Bible that is read, the book of Ruth. There are five short books at the end of the Hebrew Bible called Megillot. The word Megillot means scrolls, and they're read in synagogue, typically in scrolls. The most famous, of course, is the Scroll of Esther, which is read on Purim. Uh, Shira Shirim, the Song of Songs, read on Passover, because it describes the passionate relationship between Israel and God. The Book of Kohelet, the Book of Ecclesiastes, is read on, on Sukkot, as we reflect on life and death and vulnerability. The Book of Echa, the Book of Lamentation, read on Tisha B'Av, a book of sadness at the destruction suffered by the Jewish people. And here on Sukkot, I'm, I'm sorry, Shavuot, the Book of Ruth. The Book of Ruth takes place during the barley harvest, the early summer. So it's geographically and, uh, and seasonally the right book. But more than that, because Shavuot is the holiday of the giving of receiving of Torah, the Book of Ruth is about a woman who comes to become part of us, to receive Torah as a part of her life. It is a short book, it is a beautiful book, it is a romantic book, and it is we are source of learning um, this morning. So I'll, I'll ask you if you have a Bible at home to go and find the book of Ruth. I'll put the text up here on the screen and we can follow it um, together. In the days when the judges ruled, there was famine in the land and a man of Bethlehem in Judah with his wife and two sons went to reside in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Nomi, the son's names were Machlon and Chilion, Ephratites, they came from the village of Ephrat in Bethlehem, in the neighborhood of Bethlehem in Judah. They came to the country of Moab and they remained there. That's how the Bible, that's how the Bible opens the story. It's a, a, an opening um, sort of overture. All of the Bible, all of the Torah is about coming home. The Torah is about the journey from the house of bondage to the promised land. The rest of the Bible reflects our love of the land and our desire to return to the land so that we might continue Jewish life in that land. But here we have a man who lives on the land. He's born on the land, he's bred on the land, and yet when there comes a famine, he leaves the land. The land doesn't claim him. His family doesn't claim him. The covenant doesn't claim him. Elimelech is the ultimate image of the opportunist. When a famine comes, he leaves. And the irony, of course, he lives in a place called Beit Lechem, a place of bread. And when there's no bread, he leaves. The names mean something in the book of Ruth. Eli Melech, my God is king. That's the sound of the opportunist who said, I'm going to leave now. My God is king. I will make my own rules. I am not claimed by family, community, or covenant. I'm not claimed by tradition or history. I'll go where I want to go. And of all the places to go, he goes to Moab. Now, what is Moab? Today, it's just to the east. It's where the country of Jordan is. So presumably, if there's famine in Israel, there would be famine there. But more than that, the Moabites, the people of Moab, were, uh, we had animosity toward them. They're actually our cousins. And um, more than being our cousins, they impeded our progress on the way out of Egypt. When Moses and the people of Israel approached the land of Israel, the Moabites blocked the way and refused to let us pass, even though we promised not to touch any of the resources of their land. And that violates the ethic of the desert. The ethic of the desert is hospitality. When a guest, a family member comes, you, you open your house. But Moab, instead of being friendly, blocked our way. So there's a vendetta against Moab. And you'll see at the end of my worksheet, the Torah says that you have to respect an Egyptian because you lived in his land for so long. But Moabites are not allowed to marry into the people of Israel for 10 generations. They're not allowed to become part of us for 10 generations. And that's where Elimelech takes his family. Sort of like uh, you see a family in the supermarket and they say, we're leaving, we're, we're relocating. And you say, oh, where are you going? And they say, yeah, we're going to go to Libya or Saudi Arabia. We're going to go to a place where uh, you wouldn't expect to find a Jewish family. They go to Moab. And then the Torah's judgment on this man comes down swiftly. Elimelech, Nomi's husband, died and she was left with her two sons. Now, first he died, which means the Torah is trying to say that a man without roots, a human being without a sense of connection, without a place that he calls home, without a family that is his, without a community that he belongs to, 
can't live in this world. It's like cut flowers. There's nothing to nourish it. And after a little bit of time, it will wither and die. Elimelech dies. But notice the structure of the sentence. Elimelech, who is Nomi's husband. Now, usually it's the other way around. The, the wife is associated, as, associated with her husband. But here, he is identified as her husband because his role in this is really incidental. She's the star. She is the spotlight of the story. And she is left bereft with two children. So what does she need to do? She marries them, but she marries them to locals. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and one named Ruth. They lived another 10 years. And these two, Machlon and Chilion, also died. Now, Machlon and Chilion died. That shouldn't come as a surprise. The Hebrew name Machlon comes from the word chole, meaning sick, and Chilion means kala, meaning finished. So here are my sons, death and desolation. And they're not long for the world either. But now, what happens to Nomi? She is a woman in a man's world. She is an Israelite living in the foreign country of Moab. She is a widow without a man to protect her. And she has these two daughters-in-law. These three women now live together without husbands. They have no status. There's, there's no place on the social grid for them. They're basically lost in the world. So Nomi started out with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For in Moab, she'd heard that the Lord had taken note of his people and given them food. Accompanied by her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she'd been living. They set out on the road back to the land of Judah. Well, what's going to happen now, you'll see this over and again in the book of Ruth. It's about the decisions we make. It's about the crossroads we stand on. And in this case, we literally stand on a crossroad. In one direction, is the choice whose consequences we can foresee. It's controllable, it's predictable, and therefore it's conservative, it's safe. And in the other, there's a chance for something more profound, a transcendent choice, a risky choice, yes, with no sense of control or predictability, but a choice that just might lead to, a, to something even greater. So Nomi says to these two young women, Turn back each to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you've dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant each a find security in the house of a husband. She kissed them farewell. They broke into weeping and said, no, we will return with your people, to your people. But Nomi replied, turn back, daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I any more sons in my body who can be husbands for you? The custom was that if a woman died childless, she'd be automatically married to that man's next relative. But there are no relatives here at least not here in Moab, and Nomi can't generate any more children in time for them to have kids. Turn back, my daughters. I'm too old to be married. I have nothing to give you. I have no way to provide for you. I have no, I have no status that I can share with you that might give you a position on the social map. You'll be invisible as I'm invisible. Even if I thought there were hope, even if I married tonight and brought, had sons, should you wait for them? Should you debar yourselves from marriage? No, my daughter, my lot is far more bitter than yours for the Lord of the hand of the Lord has struck out against me. Her name is Nomi, which means sweetness. But now she is bitter. Mara. She is the bitter one because she's lost the men in her life. The love is her life, her, her husband and her two sons. And the hand of the Lord has struck out against me. When we are in grief, when a person is mourning, it's personal. It's not just it happened. Especially three deaths in a row like this, two sons and a husband, she really feels that God has it out for her. She has this sense of personal, something's happening to her personally. The women broke into weeping and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and bid farewell. And but Ruth clung to her. Now Orpah turns around and walks out and walks away. And where did she go? Well, one theory is, of course, that she went back to her family. And she married a nice orthodontist and raised kids and joined the Moabite Republican Club and played cards on Thursday afternoon and lived a beautiful and loving and conventional and uninteresting life. And then, of course, there's another theory that says she ended up in Chicago and had a television show. Yes, that's really her name, because it's really hard to say Orb for Winfrey, so they changed it to Oprah. Um, who knows? But Orpah, the Hebrew word Orpah means the nape of the neck. 
And if you imagine this, that she's wearing a burqa, a full length gown of mourning, and she's wearing a headdress, the only part of her flesh that is exposed is the nape of her neck. And when she walks away from us, that's the last thing that we see. Orpah walks away from Ruth, walks away from Naomi, walks away from our people, and goes to live the conventional life, hopefully happily and blessed, and she kiss, is kissed farewell. But Ruth, Ruth makes a different choice. Ruth clung to her. So finally, one more time, Naomi says, see your sister-in-law has returned to her people and her gods. Go and follow your sister-in-law. There's a custom you know in Jewish faith that when someone comes to convert to join the Jewish people, we push them off three times. Three times we tried to discourage them. This is the origin of that custom because three times Nomi says, don't come with me. I have nothing to give you. This is not a way of life. Go. And three times Ruth remains. And now Ruth offers the most wonderful soliloquy in the entire book. One of the most famous soliloquies in all of the, of the Bible. See your sister-in-law's return, you go. But Ruth replied, do not urge me to leave you, to turn back and not follow you. For where you go, I go. Where you lodge, I lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus and more may the Lord do to me if anything but death departs me from you. When Nomi saw how determined she was to go, she ceased to argue. Nomi can say nothing. But what a beautiful statement. Don't tell me to go away. Don't tell me to turn back. Where you go, I go. Where you live, I live. Your people are my people, and your God is my God. Notice several things. Notice the order. I go with you. I live with you. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. That's the way someone enters our circle. We are a circle. We are a people. And if someone wishes to become part of us, to become a Jew, to join our circle, it starts out by living with us and sharing life with us, making a Seder, making Shabbos, coming to the synagogue. We start out doing things, living together. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. The, the sense of community, the affiliation with our peoplehood, the sense of family that comes with Jewishness precedes theology. There are people who come to us and say, I've fallen in love with the God of Israel. I've fallen in love with Jewish religion. I want to become a Jew. But more often than not, they come and say, I've fallen in love with a Jew. Or better yet, I've, I've fallen in love with the Jewish people, with the Jewish family, with the community. And I want to join the community. And then God is God. And then the question is, how, how does she know our people? And how does she know our God? How did she come to learn that? I don't recall there being a JCC in Moab, and probably not many synagogues either. So where was it that Ruth came to know the God of Israel? And where was it that she came to know the ways and teachings of the people of Israel? Well, the only place to know it would be in Nomi's home. And what did she see? Well, let's ask the question in a more broad way. When people become part of us, when they join the Jewish people, when they convert to Judaism and join our circle, what is it that they saw? What is it that they see which makes them feel, this is a people I want to join, this is a life I want to live, this is a God I want to worship? I've asked that many, many times to young people who grow, people of all ages who come to see me to become Jewish. And the answers always astonish me because there are things that we Jews, living Jewish life, never see or don't see clearly enough, but they see it. She says to me, I like the way that my family lights candles on Friday night. I like the way we gather around a table and talk and share life. I like the way that the Jewish family functions. That's one of the ways. And maybe, maybe Nomi didn't light candle Shabbos, I don't know, but at least that's the way so many Ruths of our age come to see us. Others have said, I like the opportunity to question that the Seder begins with the child's questions that I'm encouraged to question and to, and to seek and to inquire. I like that spirit of the Jewish people. I like the ethics of the Jewish people, your concern for the downtrodden, for the needy and the poor. I think that's important. 
And then sometimes if you look at this text, there's one other hint here. Ruth has experienced now two deaths, the death of her husband, Machlon, and the death of her brother-in-law, Chilion, and by vicariously the death of her father-in-law, Elimelech. Is it in the way that Jews treat death that she falls in love with us? There's a wonderful philosopher named Harvey Cox. He's a theologian. He teaches at Harvard University. He's an ordained Baptist minister, professor of Christian theology at Harvard University. He's married to a Jewish woman, married a very long time. They live a Jewish life. That was the agreement they made when they got married. And Harvey Cox wrote a beautiful book once called Common Prayers, where he discusses how an outsider sees us, how an outsider experiences Jewish life. And in the course of the book, um, I think it's her, her mother dies, her father dies. The, 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 her member, his wife's family member dies. And the family goes through the rites of mourning, the funeral, the shiva, the shloshim. Cox writes a whole chapter about this. Begins with the beautiful words, Jews do death extraordinarily well. What did Ruth see? What do all of our newly made Jews see that makes them fall in love with us? And they fall in love. It's a deep and abiding connection, but it's never easy. And that's one of the themes of this book. Watch what happens next. Nomi can't even answer her. Because people who are born Jewish often, too often, way too often, have deep prejudice against those who would join us from the outside. They think that they're not quite fully Jewish because they can't cook matzo balls or tell jokes with Yiddish punchlines. And Nomi has nothing to say. Finally, they reach Bethlehem. They make the journey. And when they arrive in Bethlehem, the whole city buzzes because she hasn't been there in at least 10 years. And she left with a husband and two children. And she arrives with only Ruth. The city buzzes and the people say, can this be Nomi? People who experience extremes of grief show it on their face. Her hair is turned gray. Her body sags with the weight of her pain and her grief. Her face is different. And people say, my God, can it even be the same person? Just look. And she said, don't call me Nomi. Call me Mara. Don't call me sweetness. Call me bitterness. For Shaddai, God, has made my lot very bitter. I went away full and God has brought me back empty. I went away full and brought me back empty. How can you call me Nomi when God has been so harsh with me? And thus, the, the, this chapter ends with a, a summary statement with one important detail. Thus, Nomi returned from the country of Moab. She returned with her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the Moabite. They arrived at Bethlehem at the beginning of the harvest. Ruth gains a last name. When she was in Moab, her name was just Ruth. But now, she is Ruth, the Moabite, Hamoaviah. And remember, in ancient Israel, Moab was an enemy. Moab was not a friend. Moab was not a kinsman. Moab was an enemy. The Moabite means the other, the alien, the outsider, the one who has come to, to pollute us, to, to impede our progress. There, there is a, a whole vocabulary that we Jews have developed for outsiders. Insiders and outsiders, goyim, shegit, shiks, all of these words, they're, they're in some ways deeply disgusting because they don't see the person. And that's what happens here. Ruth the Moabite is the equivalent of Ruth the Shiksala. Shiksa is a Yiddish word based on the Hebrew word sheketz, which means a reptile, something that has come to pollute us. A sheketz is when you touch a sheketz, you have to go through a special process in order to be available to participate in the ritual life of the world. You are polluted, you're impure. Ruth, the impure one, they don't see her. They don't see her soul. They don't see her loyalty to the God of Israel and to the people of Israel and to her mother-in-law. They only see outsider. Now there's a white space here as you see between the white, the, uh, the chapter one and chapter two. So let's fill that in a moment. When Ruth, when Nomi, sorry, Nomi and Elimelech left 10 years ago, they didn't know they'd be gone so long. It was just a famine. That's a seasonal thing. They, they thought they'd be back. So the house is still there. It's been locked and it's been a while and they, they covered the furniture to keep it from getting dusty. But now they go into that house. So come with me, 
come with me on a walk through Nomi's house. She jimmies open the door, the, unlocks the front door. The lock is stiff because it hasn't been used in 10 years. And she creaks open the door. The smell is musty because no one's been in this house for 10 years. Windows are open. Air is allowed in. They take off the coverings of the furniture and shake out the dust. But poor Nomi. This was her house with Elimelech. This was her house with Machlon and Chilion. This was the house when she was a matron of the community. This was her house when she went away full. Imagine she goes from bedroom to room to kitchen to room here in the living room. What's on the walls? What's on the mantel? Here is the couch she sat on with a man she loved. Here is the floor where the children played when they were infants. Here is the kitchen where meals were prepared and shared. She walks up the stairs to the bedrooms. Each of the boys' bedrooms is intact. They weren't going to leave for that long. Here are the tokens, the, the artwork on the wall that kids created in school, the, the trophies from Little League or Warner Football, the, 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 the commendations from school, the pictures of camp, the rock stars that the boys followed. Remember um, the, the movie Ordinary People. Robert Redford won an Academy Award for directing when Mary Tyler Moore could not accept the death of her son. And then she walks into the master, the marital bedroom and the ketubah on the wall and the bed where she shared passion with her husband and the place where her children were born. And you can imagine room by room by room, poor Naomi melts on the floor. She just simply melts. A person in grief can't lift themselves up, can't, can't, can't provide for themselves. So Nomi had a, Nomi had a, um, had a kinsman, it says. On her husband's side, a man of substance from the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Ruth the Moabite said to Nomi, I'll go to the fields and glean among the ears of grain behind someone who show me kindness. They have no money. So you're allowed, if you're a poor person in that, in that era, to glean which means you follow the harvesters and whatever they drop or whatever they don't get, you're allowed to pick up. And Ruth knows this custom and she says, I will go glean. And as luck would have it, but it, nothing's luck in the Bible, of course. It was the land belonging to Boaz. So here is Ruth gleaning the field, gaining the, the droppings of the grain of the field in order to feed her mother-in-law, Naomi, who's at home melted in her grief. And, Naomi, and Ruth is out there working from dawn to dusk trying to find something to feed her mother-in-law and herself. Presently, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem. He greeted the reapers. Lord be with you. And they said, the Lord bless you. By the way, that's the opening when you ever do an aliyah in a Sephardic synagogue, Adonai Machem Baruch Adonai. That's the, that's the opening. Boaz said to the servants who was in charge of the reapers, whose girl is that? Here's an unfamiliar young woman gleaning in the field, and Boaz wants to know who it is. Because Boaz, unlike Elimelech, Boaz stayed. Boaz is the man of the community. Boaz is a man of roots. He felt the claim of the land and the covenant and the family and the community. And yes, there was a famine, but he felt the claim and he stayed in the land. And he knows everybody, and everybody knows Boaz. So he sees this unfamiliar young woman, and he says, who is she? What is she doing here? How did she find this field? And the servant who was in charge says she is the Moabite girl who came back from, with Nomi from the country of Moab. Translation, she's the Shiksala, Shiksala from Shiksa land. She's the alien, the other, the one who really, really doesn't belong. And she said, let me glean among the reapers. She's been on her feet since she came this morning. She's rested little in the hut. So now Boaz approaches her. Remember, he's a kinsman of Elimelech. He's actually Elimelech's shadow, where Elimelech is the opportunist who runs at the first hint of famine because land and community and people don't claim him. Boaz is quite the opposite. Boaz is the man who is claimed by the people he loves. He knows that he is responsible for them. And he values, above all, loyalty, connection, faithfulness, Look at verse 8. Boaz said to Ruth, what's missing? That's right. The Moabite. 
because that's not who she is in his eyes. Because Boaz sees something different. Where she comes from matters little to him. What matters is her faithfulness, her loyalty to her family, her faithfulness to, to, to Naomi, her faithfulness to God of Israel, her faithfulness. Boaz said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, don't go glean in another field. Don't go elsewhere. Stay here close to my girls. Keep your eyes on the field. Follow them. I've ordered the men not to molest you. When you're thirsty, go drink the water that the men have drawn. Don't go glean in another field. Don't go elsewhere. Stay here. This is what we should always be saying to those who come from the outside and approach us. We should say to them, the spiritual riches of Torah are yours. Don't go looking. You don't go, need to go religion shopping. In fact, religion shopping often, it leaves us empty. I, I, I know people who do this, religious nomads. I had a friend when I was in college. He was a Mormon one week and a Buddhist one week and a Hasid one week and a transcendental meditator one week and an atheist one week and a socialist one. He's looking for something and I appreciate, I appreciate that he's searching, he's looking and yet don't go glean another field. You're not gonna find the riches. You have to set yourself down, says Boaz, root yourself in a place. And yes, there'll be things that any tradition you disagree with, but that's the only way to grow, is to wrestle with that and to wrestle with what's inside of you. That's how one grows spiritually. And he says to her, you found your home, stay here. She can't believe his kindness. And, and, and just to make sure that, that, she know, that he knows who she is, she prostrates, she, she bows in front of him and says, why are you so kind to single me out? I'm a foreigner. Don't you know who I am? I'm a Moabite, I'm a shiksa, I'm an outsider. And he says, no, you're not. Because I don't judge you based on where you come from. I judge you based on who you really are. And I don't care what your origins were. I wanna know what your destination is. I want to know where you're going. Boaz said in reply, I've been told of all you did for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother, the land of your birth, and came to a people you had not known before. May the Lord re reward your deeds. May you have full recompense from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have sought refuge. Remember that phrase. We're coming back to it. Listen to the way he describes her. How you left your father and mother, the land of your birth, and came to a people you had not known. Who's he referring to? That's, of course, Ruth. That is a Ruth, but there's more to it. That's Abraham. Leave your home. Leave your father's house. Leave the place of your birth. Leave the place where you have identity and go where I will send you. Ruth mimics Abraham, except Ruth didn't hear the voice of God. Abraham heard the commandment directly from God, but Ruth, Ruth did it out of loyalty to Naomi and out of a loyalty to the people she had found, to the ideals that she had met. And Boaz recognizes that. Boaz doesn't see her national origin. Boaz sees her soul. And because of that, he's a hero in this story. The name Boaz means two things. Boaz, in him there is strength. Elimelech the opportunist dies in the very first lines of the book because he is not rooted in community, in family, in faith, in land, in covenant. Boaz is the man of roots. And because he's the man of roots, Boaz, he has strength. Nothing will shake him. The other meaning of the name Boaz, it's kind of ingenious. If you take the Hebrew letters of Boaz, it's Bet I in Zion. That's a scramble of the word Azav. Azav means to exit, to leave, to depart. Boaz is the opposite of that. He stays rooted. He stays in his land. And therefore, he has strength. She answers, you are most kind to me. And so she stays with him. Now let's skip. She comes back with the, um, with the grain, of course. And, and here is the third chapter. Are you ready? Nomi, her mother-in-law, said to her daughter, I must seek a home for you, where you will be happy. Now, when she comes home, when she comes home, Noam, Nomi says, where did you find all this grain? And she said, I met this man, 
named Boaz. Blessed be he of the Lord, says Nomi. He has not failed in his kindness. The Hebrew is lo azav chasdo. Remember azav, God has not abandoned us. His kindness has not abandoned us. The name Boaz awakens something in Nomi's heart. She's awakened and she says, I have to find a place for you, a home for you. When a person is in grief, they live in the present tense. They can only know about what they're doing right now. Sometimes we can get them to live in the past, to look back at the blessings of the life that they shared with the person that they loved. But a mourner never looks into the future. That's why it's really hard to ask a mourner if you'll meet me for lunch on Tuesday because the grief blocks them from thinking, well, what's Tuesday? What, what am I going to be doing Tuesday? So what happens? What happens is she can't tell. She can't look forward. Poor Nomi lying here on the floor. And yet, when she hears the name Boaz, something awakes in her heart and she says, this I have to do. And now a plan begins to form. Daughter, I must seek a home for you. Now there's our kinsman Boaz, whose girls you were close to. He'll be winnowing barley on the threshing floor tonight. So bathe yourself, anoint yourself, dress up, go down to the threshing floor, but do not disclose yourself to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place he lies down and go over and uncover his <clears throat> feet and lie down. He'll tell you what to do. All right, first you have to understand a little geography. In the south of Israel, they grow barley. Barley is a grain. It's a grass. It has a, a seed that, that pops, that opens up, that ripens. The trick with barley is you want to let it ripen as much as possible before you cut it, before you harvest it. But it can't be rained on. Because if barley gets rained on after it's ripened, it rots. And then there's nothing to eat. So what's the task? The barley farmer waits and waits and waits and waits till the exact right moment at the end of spring and the very beginning of summer. And then the whole community goes out collectively. All the men go out into the fields and they eat and drink and live and sleep in the fields because they cut, 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 cut all of the barley. And then they schlep all the barley into the barns. And they thresh and they thresh and they thresh this barley. And it has to be siloed before the rain of the springtime starts. Otherwise, otherwise, they will lose it to rot. So they thresh and they thresh and they thresh and they silo and they silo and they silo. And they work nonstop for days and days together, all the men of the community sleeping there in the threshing floor. And then when all the barley is threshed and all the barley is siloed, well, what do you make out of barley? You make beer. It's Miller time. And that's exactly what happens. It's time to thresh the barley, to silo the barley. And once the barley harvest is brought in, and we know that we're going to eat this, this summer, we'll have plenty to eat. They made a very strong beer. And the men of the community would sit and drink the beer and then would pass out on the threshing floor. It was a men's place. A place of men. And what is Nomi telling Ruth to do? Well, she says, bathe yourself, which is for special occasions. Anoint yourself, perfume yourself. Put on your red dress and your high heel shoes and go down to the threshing floor. I've always thought that this should have a B.B. King soundtrack. Go down to the threshing floor. This is a remarkable statement. In some ways, it's terrifying. It's simply terrifying. The Bible has three words for people who are vulnerable. The stranger, the widow, and the orphan. Ruth is all three. She is a stranger in this society. She is a widow. And inasmuch as she separated herself from her parents and followed Nomi, she's an orphan. And she's a woman, a young woman, an attractive young woman, a woman of, of sexual age, as it were. And she's being told to do what? To bathe, to anoint herself, to perfume herself, to dress up, to go down to the men's place, to stand where the men stand, to enter that place, to go to the man who has eaten and drunk and is drunk and is sleeping and to go and to seduce him. 
it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. And and what is Nomi, what is Nomi counting on? That Boaz is a mensch, that Boaz will not simply rape her and forget her and toss her out because he could very well do that and she would have no redress. He could simply have her and discard her, which men do to women all the time. But she's counting on the fact that he has a soul and that he will treat her in a different way. So what does he do? What does he do? He says, go down and eat and drink and he will take, tell you what to do. This is a terrifying story of female vulnerability. And what it's doing here, I think, is describing the vulnerability of someone who comes into our circle. We draw a circle. Every community draws a circle. Every family draws a circle. And we defend the lines of that circle. And then, and then when someone tries to enter our circle, how do we treat them? Are they welcomed? Are they celebrated? Are they cherished? Or do we make it so very difficult? It's really hard to come into a, a place where you don't know the words, you don't know the gestures, you don't know the customs, you don't know the ways. You feel like a fool, you feel like an outsider. And that's who Nomi is. I think on the one hand, this is a parable for those who come into the circle of our Jewish life. It's a parable about how terrifying it is to walk into a synagogue where you know no one and no word, you don't know the words, to walk into a culture where you're not familiar. And you put yourself at risk. You, you, you lay yourself bare. It's a terrifying thing. But it's terrifying in any circumstance when you enter a circle, a cultural circle that is closed. And here is the sense of vulnerability. But watch what happens. She went down to the threshing floor. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. She went down to the threshing floor and did as her mother-in-law had instructed her. Boaz ate and drank and in a cheerful mood went to lie down beside the grain pile. Then she went stealthily and uncovered his feet. That's a metaphor, of course, a euphemism. And she laid down. In the middle of the night, the man gave a start and pulled back. There was a woman lying at his feet. It's wonderful because you see the scene through his eyes. I, I imagine Boaz is Ali Melech's uh, contemporary, which would mean that he's as old as her father-in-law. He, he's an older guy. And, and because there's no sense that he has a wife in this story, he's a widow. He's a widower. And let's just posit that it's been a long time since he's been with a woman. And, and let's just point out as well, by the way, that the Torah is unabashed about things sexual. It's not embarrassed. This is part of life. So what happens? Boaz has been working and working and working. Boaz has been drinking and drinking and drinking. And Boaz wakes up in the middle of the night. And there's a, a beautiful woman lying there. And she's uncovered his uh, feet. Adventures in podiatry. And he doesn't know if he's awake or asleep. He doesn't know if this is real or if this is a dream. All he knows is it's wonderful because it's been so long that he's had these passions. It's been so long since he's had this feeling. And he gives a start and he looks and there was a woman and he says to her, who are you? Those of you who've studied Torah with me know that the questions of the Torah, the questions of the Bible, that's why the narrative was written. The whole narrative is about the question. The whole narrative is a midrash, a setting for the question, who are you is exactly the question. Are you Israelite or Moabite? And, and what makes you Israelite or Moabite? Your national origin, your genetics, or your character? Who do you want to be? What's your destination in life? Who are you, he asks. And she replied, I am your handmaid, Ruth. Spread your robe over your handmaid, for you are redeeming kinsmen. That's a complicated line. First of all, spread your robe over me is a sign of betrothal in Jewish life. You ever been to a Sephardic wedding? We wrap the, the bride and groom in a talit. <coughs> Excuse me. Spreading a robe over one 
is a sign that you are connected. And remember, his blessing earlier, his blessing earlier was, may you be rewarded under the wings of God's presence. And so she says, spread your wings over me. Spreading, his, spreading wings over her protects her. It is, in just natural parlance, a, a sign of protection, of, of embrace, of engulfing someone in your love and your protection. She says, you are my goel. Now, the Hebrew word goel has many, many references. On the one hand, it's a technical legal term. The technical legal term goel is the person who is closest to the family when the family needs to sell a piece of property. We'll see that in a few minutes. The goel is the one who buys the property, has right of first refusal on the property. That's the technical legal part. But goel means much more than that. It means you are my rescuer. You are my savior. You're the one who's come to rescue me, to save me. You are my hope. Spread your robe over me for you are my goel in every sense of the word. And he exclaims to her, and watch this speech now, because it's quite beautiful. Be blessed of the Lord, daughter. This is the second time he's blessed her, right? The first time was when in the field, when he heard of her loyalty. Be blessed of the Lord, daughter, for your latest deed of loyalty is greater than your first. In that you've not turned to younger men, richer, or poorer. Now, daughter, have no fear. I will do in your behalf what you ask. For the elders of the town know what a fine woman, but it's true that I'm the redeemer. <clears throat> there is another closer than me. Stay the night. In the morning, I will. If he, if he will act as redeemer, good, let him redeem. But if he doesn't want to act as redeemer for you, I will do so. As the Lord lives, lie here until morning. He says twice to her, stay here till morning. I think that's quite beautiful. If this were a good Protestant text, he would say, go home and save your reputation. Until we're married, we can't touch each other. But it's a more realistic text. They understand, the Torah, the Bible understands who this man is. It's been so long. And she has awakened something inside of him. And he says to her, spend the night with me. Let's spend the night together, as the great Rabbi Mick Jagger once sang. Stay for the night. And yet, he says to her, look, in the technical legal sense, in the technical legal sense, there's another kinsman who's closer to me and therefore has the right first before me to, carry, to care for you and has the right before me to care for the family's property. There's someone who's closer than me and we'll take care of that another time. But it's his first statement, which I think is most beautiful. Be blessed, of be blessed of the Lord, daughter. Your latest deed of loyalty is greater than your first in that you haven't turned to, other, to younger men, rich or poor. Your latest deed of loyalty is greater than your first. Her first deed of loyalty was rescuing Nomi, coming with Nomi back from Moab and making sure that Nomi was fed. That was her first deed of loyalty. What is her latest deed of loyalty? Well, he tells you, you haven't turned to younger men, poorer or richer. You came to me. You've rescued me. Here is poor Boaz, and it's been years and years and years since he's been with a woman. And this young woman cr crawls in his bed, as it were, and sidles up to him and seduces him. And suddenly he's responding in a way that he didn't know he could, in a way that he didn't know he was capable in a way that he couldn't have dreamed of. Your latest deed of loyalty is greater than your first. You've revived me. You've revived and renewed me. You've given me back powers of virility and fertility and masculinity. You've helped me find things inside of me I didn't know I had. You first rescued Nomi, who was all by herself and starving. You gave food and nurture to her, and now you come to me and rescue me. You are the Goel, or the Goelet. You are the one who has rescued, not me. And what is the Bible saying? That when we open the circle and welcome the outsider who is loyal like we are, who values what we value, who is interested, deeply committed to live with the God of Israel and the people of Israel, we find powers inside of us we didn't know we had. We awaken parts of ourselves we didn't know we had. It's a beautiful statement. That outsider 
revived something inside us. So she stayed there all night. In the morning, he gave her a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of, uh, of grain. And, and then the drama concludes. And the fourth chapter is simply the denouement. Boaz has to take care of that other fellow, the other redeemer. So Boaz went to the gate. All, all transactions are taken care of at the gate. And Boaz said to the redeemer, come by and sit down. And the redeemer, the other relative, the relative who's closer than Boaz, who would have first right of refusal on both the property and the woman, his name is Plony Almoni. I know it sounds odd, but that's the guy's name. And Boaz says, look, Nomi returned from Moab. She has to sell the land belonging to our kinsman Elimelech. I should disclose this to you and say, acquire the land in the presence of the elders. <clears throat> if you're willing to redeem it, great. If not, I'll take it. Now, Boaz's Plony Almoni, who knows a good deal when he sees one, says, I will take, I will take the land. Because here's why. Whatever it's going to cost him, he has to pay Nomi for the land. Whatever it's going to cost him is worth it. Why is it worth it? Because he will acquire a piece of land in a time and a place where it's very hard to get more land. I mean, it's a small village and there's so many fields and here's a chance to get a very choice field. So he says, I will take the land. And when he dies, of course, that land will be given to his children. So as a financial transaction, it makes a lot of sense. You see, he'll pay it off. He'll pay, he'll pay for it. And over the years, the fruit of that land will pay for whatever he paid for it. And even if it exceeds his own lifetime, even if it takes harvests in years 10 and 12 and 15 and 20 and 100, at least somewhere or another, that land will pay for itself through its harvest. And it will be worth the transaction that he paid for it. But then Boaz, who is so clever, says, oh, yes. And you got to do one more thing you have to take Ruth, the Moabite. Because as you are the redeeming kinsman for the land, you are also the redeeming kinsman for the wife. Now, here's a very important rule. If a woman has, it dies, if a woman is a widow and she die, and she has, and her husband dies and she has not had kids, so they don't have an heir, the closest relative marries that woman in order to produce an heir who's, who will carry on the name of the deceased will carry on the name of the deceased. So if Plony Almoni marries Ruth and they have a kid, that kid will not be Ben Plony, the son of Plony. That kid will be Ben Machalon, Ben Elimelech. And therefore, the piece of property that he bought is not going to go to his heirs. It's not going to be part of his estate forever. It's going to go to that kid. And therefore, if the price of it is more than he'll get out of it during his lifetime and his children won't inherit it, it's not worth buying. But if it's not worth buying and he doesn't function as the, as the, as the, re, the redeemer, what he's done is reject his obligation to preserve the name of his kinsman here on the land. And that's a terrible insult because the name of a kinsman is going to die Unless you marry this girl, unless you marry this girl, we're going to forget all about it. His, his immortality will be cut short. And therefore, there is a custom of shaming that one who chose his own financial well-being over his obligation to protect the name and the immortality of his deceased relative. And the Bible is upset, uh, upset with Plony Almoni. It's, it's just so upset, it's, it's incensed at him. And so what it does is it curses him. Plony Almoni becomes in all the rest of Jewish history the name of anonymity. Plony Almoni is John Doe. In Israel, if you get junk mail, it's addressed to Plony Almoni, occupant, resident, to whom it may concern. Plony Almoni becomes the name of anonymity because he refused to protect the name of his loved one. And now Boaz completes the transaction. He agrees to take the land. He agrees to support Naomi. He agrees to marry Ruth. Everyone cheers. They, people say that we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who's coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel, prosper in Ephrat and perpetuate your name in Bethlehem. And may your name be like Peretz, whom Tamar brought to Judah. So, of course, you see what the game is here. These are all Judean names. And Rachel and Leah 
married to Jacob sort of surreptitiously in the dark when one sister was, was switched with the other. And Peretz, who is born to Tamar, when Tamar seduces her father-in-law in the dark, in the tent, everyone knows that this was an act of sexual intrigue, but it comes out well because it perpetuates the covenant. And that's how God works in history here, through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this woman. Where is God in this story? There's no hand of God. There's no voice of God. There's no God controlling except this, that in their passion, that in their love, that in their loyalty, Boaz finds Ruth. Boaz, the man of roots, finds Ruth, the woman of loyalty, and they marry. And the Lord let her conceive, and she bore a son. And the woman said to Nomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not withheld a redeemer from you. And now there's a new redeemer, the child, because Nomi now has status. She's a bubby. She's a grandma. She's a safta. And now she has somebody. She has somebody to love and somebody to give her a place on the social grid, the social map. <clears throat> Everyone says, he will, may his name be perpetuated. He will renew your life and sustain your old age, for he is born of your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better than seven sons. She became its foster his mother. And everybody said, Mazel tov, a son is born to Nomi. Poor, poor Ruth had to go through birth. And he, he, they named him Oved, which means the servant. Loyalty, after all, is what's important in this family. He was the father of Yishai, who was the father of Melech David, the King David. This whole story is the birth story of King David, who is the great-grandson of, 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 of Ruth, and, of Ruth and, and Boaz. So who is King David? The king who unites the, the people of Israel, the king who is the eternal symbol of the people of Israel, and the king for who will one day himself be the ancestor of the Messiah, the Goel, the Redeemer, Mashiach ben David. So how do you get Mashiach ben David? You marry Ruth's loyalty to Boaz's rootedness. You marry loyalty to rootedness. You marry the strength of family loyalty and the vision of care to the strength of roots, and you end up with redemption in the world. How do you get Melech David? How do you bring redemption to the Jewish people and to the world? You open the circle and allow the outsider to come in. No longer is she Ruth the Moabite. It says so in verse 13, Boaz married whom? Ruth, not Ruth the Moabite, but Ruth. When we see the soul of the other and recognize that that is my kinsman, that is my family, that your origin doesn't matter, your genetics don't matter to us, it's your destination that matters. Your heart, your soul, your nishama, that's what matters. Oh, and one more thing. Every name has a meaning in this story, of course. Elimelech, my God is king. He's the opportunist. Machlon and Chilion, death and desolation, didn't have long to live. Nomi is sweetness, who becomes Mara, bitterness, who goes back to being sweetness on the day she becomes a bubby. Boaz, Boaz, in him there is strength. Lo azav chasdo, he did not depart. His kindness stayed here with us. And finally, Ruth. What's the meaning of the word Ruth, root in Hebrew? Well, here's one suggestion that one scholar made. Her great-grandson, David, is going to write a book. He's going to do a lot of great things. He's going to kill Goliath. He's going to unite the tribes of Israel. He's going to establish Jerusalem as his city. He's going, to, he's going to make us into a great people. He's going to be the ancestor of the Messiah. And along the way, he had time to write a book of poetry called the Psalms. The most famous of which is the 23rd Psalm, right? Adonai roi loach sar, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Read the 23rd Psalm and read it as a parable of this story. Gam lech begeit salmavit lo irara ki ata imadi, though I walk in the valley of death's shadow, I'm not afraid because you're with me. And at the end, what does it say? Kosi rivaya. My cup overflows. Rivaya, overflowing cup. Overflowing cup, rivaya. The noun abstract of that word, overflowingness, is Ruth. She is the overflowing cup of blessing that, that we found in our history. And everyone who comes to be with us, 
to share our life as a people, to bring us new forces of creativity and spirituality, to share our faith, to, sit, to stand with us in moments of joy and moments of difficulty. Everyone who enters our circle is that overflowing cup. I thank you for listening. I want to wish you and all you love a happy and healthy Shavuot, a sweet holiday. Take very, very good care.